Let me paint a picture for you. You're an online anti-social justice warrior behind a keyboard who needs to touch grass. You're worried about the significant and growing backlash against historical institutions, ideas, beliefs, groups, and even words on the basis that the aforementioned lists are bigoted and hurtful to the marginalized and that they must be removed and slowly transitioned away from society. You're concerned the scope of what you could actually say in public is slowly closing. Things like political correctness and cancel culture are concepts that come to mind for this. Then you have another, more progressive keyboard warrior, who similar to you may need to get out of the house, more or less approves this backlash to stop so-called bigotry. Out of desperation, you start to claim your free speech is under attack. The visibly annoyed progressive sighs and retorts, your free speech isn't under attack, since the government isn't censoring you or what you say. Freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom from consequences. Besides, what you are saying is dangerous. A beloved friend of the channel, Sam Seder, it's no stranger to calling others hateful. What we're, we're really seeing, I think, in many respects, is a uh, Islamophobia. And, you know, this is where uh, folks like we, you know, we had problems for a long time uh, with, with folks like Sam Harris because they uh, mainstream this stuff and they make it sound like it can be intellectual. Now but more on him later. On this particular issue, I personally found it hard to understand the side that wants to limit hate speech. Of course, bigotry is bad in all of its forms, but I've always considered the measures used within political correctness and council culture to be excessive and arguably more dangerous than the minuscule hate speech that they want to clamp down on. But then one bread tuber managed to articulate the core of the progressive argument quite well. In Philosophy 2's video on anarchism, it is explained that the main facet of anarchists is resisting power. The British bread tuber elaborates on this concept by providing a definition of power. Political scientist Michael Taylor says that power is the ability to alter the range of someone's available actions, to expand or to limit somebody's options. Fawn soon provides various examples of power based on this definition. So for instance, if I'm the government, I can pass laws that limit your options, or I can repeal laws and extend your options. Parents expand or limit the options of their children. That's another kind of power. Your boss probably expands or limits your choices in terms of when you're allowed to turn up at work and when you're allowed to leave. If you injure somebody or kill them, you exercise power over their choices in terms of how they can use their body. However, the final example he gave caught my attention. If you commit hate speech, you limit somebody's options in terms of how they are seen in public and maybe even how they see themselves. And this line, despite only being a few seconds of the video, explains the phenomenon thoroughly. According to the left, if you use your free speech in a hateful way, you are using power that will increase negative perceptions of innocent minorities, which leads to their options being limited due to greater discrimination arising from said hate speech. We on the right may respond that we can't let this justify the suppression of free speech, but progressives will just reiterate that they are also for free speech. So what is the real divide here? Philosophy Tube pondered similar questions in another video called The Philosophy of Antifa. Some people say that fascism is despicable, but fascists have a right to their opinion. What's interesting is that many anti-fascist actors would agree. Their goal is not to strike down the laws that guarantee free speech. So what's the source of the conflict here? Well, let's dig a little deeper. As prologue, we should note that the free speech issue and the violence issue can't really be separated. It might seem very neat and enlightened and compassionate to say, I don't support fascist ideas, but I'll defend their right to express them. But remember, all political ideologies involve violence somewhere. What that can in practice translate to is police subjecting people to violence because they get called up to do the actual business of protecting that fascist speech. For instance, at the Battle of Cable Street in 1936, the British Union of Fascists decided they wanted to march through the East End of London, and about 20,000 people from the local community turned up to block the march. They didn't want fascists in their community, they'd already tried and failed ahead of time to get the government to stop the march, the government refused, and because the march was therefore technically legal, the police protected the fascists and attacked the anti-fascist protesters, who ended up having to fight not just fascists, but their own police force as well, the very people who were ostensibly meant to be defending their community against threats.
Of course, there is failure to mention that the freedom of groups to march, no matter how heinous they are, is applicable to all, including anti-fascists and fascists. The anti-fascists were blocking the marches from happening, which is prohibiting freedoms as well as attacked the fascists. Even the police were attacked with rotten vegetables. The police weren't protecting fascists over anti-fascists because they liked fascists. The fascists were part of a non-violent march until the blockades occurred. The police would have interfered with the fascist marches if they were actually violent. Of course, it was more than suspicious that they were going to Jewish and minority areas, which is why the police were there to make sure that the fascists didn't try anything, since the police also protect the freedoms of minorities from fascists. Regardless, I understand why people did this, especially with what followed a few years later in Europe, but disrupting the marches and freedoms of fascists creates precedent and justification to disrupt the marches and freedoms of anti-fascists, communists and minorities, because freedom has to be applied consistently for it to properly work. Otherwise, loopholes can be created and abused by authoritarians to snatch even more freedoms and possibly even create a fascist state. After all, some would argue that is the story of Nazi Germany, but that is for another day. Principled usage of freedom prevents fascism. Other examples of police involvement in defending the freedoms of fascists is stated, but you get the point. I offer these examples not to try and sway you in any way, but just to show you that when fascist free speech is advanced on paper, it's enforced in the streets by police violence. And so because some free speech drowns out other free speech, it matters whose specific free speech we support. And here, Philosophy Tube reinforces and elaborates on the previous point of hate speech limiting people, that certain types of free speech can be amplified over other types of free speech in a true, unregulated marketplace of ideas, and the free speech being amplified can be hate speech, which, as mentioned before, can limit the options of minorities. I really want to hit home this point because it is that relevant for the later part of this video. The myths at the core of fascism, the bad statistics, the made-up history, the really off-the-wall stuff we'll be getting to later on, it doesn't really matter to a committed fascist how many times you sit down and debunk that stuff. They keep today's Wednesday saying today's Wednesday. That's because it's not so much about the content, but the act of saying it. And that's how we spot propaganda. The job of propaganda isn't necessarily to convince anyone. Propaganda is a recruitment tool. It gathers and retains the people who understand the true message and who are willing to repeat it. It doesn't really matter to a committed white nationalist how many times you sit down and debunk the ridiculous white nationalist conspiracy that the world is secretly being taken over by Jews. Because when they say that, they aren't really saying that it's true. What they're saying is, they want to persecute Jewish people. And their audience are all running around trying to explain the days of the week, saying, come on our talk show and explain your weird theory about the days of the week. Bring this idea to the free marketplace of ideas that we may debunk it. Whilst some of their audience are sitting there going, oh, I get it. Today's Wednesday. The liberal love of free speech is a great thing, but it assumes that everybody's coming to the table in good faith and is willing to play the game, which fascists obviously aren't. That's why it is worth countering fascist arguments in order to try and reach potential recruits before they can, but anti-fascists will try to deny fascist platforms. Because when we interview fascists or we debate fascists, they're not really there for us. They're there for our audience. Whilst we're up there talking about the days of the week, there's a guy at the back of the lecture theatre handing out pamphlets about the Wednesday question. There is a lot on free speech within this Antifa video, and maybe it deserves a video all on its own. But delving any further will deviate from the main point of this video. Anyways, from Ford's own words, we can deduce that bigots and or fascists will lie because they are intellectually dishonest. They have no rational or statistical basis for their bigotry. After all, as Ezra Klein has said, debates that sell themselves as about free speech are really about power, and that power can limit the choices of innocent minorities. If Ford's argument is true, then we can infer that we shouldn't trust or take seriously people who we consider bigots. That once they receive the label of fascist, bigot, racist, sexist, homophobe, transphobe, Islamophobe, or anti-Semite, 
they should be delegitimized and any objections they have to that label should be ignored due to their bad faith nature. After all, they should be shut down by the benevolent anti-fascists. We shouldn't debate fascists or anti-Semites who criticize the Jewish homeland. We shouldn't care what bigots like Ben Shapiro, Steven Crowder, Jordan Peterson, Ilan Omar, and Sam Seder think. Wait, what? It's easy to spot anti-Semitism when it's a bunch of crazy people with tiki torches screaming Jews will not replace us. Yes. What's trickier is tweets like Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's recently deleted about how Israel has, quote, hypnotized the world to carry out, quote, evil. That is harder to spot as anti-Semitic, which makes it more dangerous, you think, how so? does make it more dangerous because, as you said, when you see people marching with tiki torches or you hear the Pittsburgh killer writing on social media, all Jews must die, that's very obviously eliminationist. The problem with anti-Semitism from the far left is that it often, oftentimes is smuggled into the mainstream under the guise of progressive values. Of course, I don't know that he's responsible uh, for this, but, you know, the, the general tenor. Um, and for also, instance, just can I just read this quote really quick from Congressman Juan Vargas, though, because he, you know, he showed the ball. He said it's disturbing that Rep. Omar continues to perpetuate hurtful anti-Semitic stereotypes that misrepresent our Jewish community. Total smear and lie. Just have to always say that. Additionally, questioning the support for the U.S. relationship, a U.S. Israeli Israel relationship is unacceptable. That's the bottom line. Oh, mine. Remember that clip I played earlier, where Sam Seder called someone an Islamophobe? That was in response to a certain Muslim congresswoman being accused of anti-Semitism. Some of you may recall that congresswoman Ilhan Omar tweeted some anti-Israel stuff that was deemed anti-Semitic, such as claiming that Israel was hypnotizing the world, or insinuating that American support for Israel was based on donations, with reference to some Benjamins. In response, Many Jewish House Democrats called on Nancy Pelosi to reject both anti-Semitism and reiterate their continued support of the Israeli state. And now progressive Sam Seder is enraged by conflating criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. Well, I am sorry Sam Seder, but according to the anti-fascist playbook, when you're accused of bigotry, we can't trust you because bigots are automatically bad faith. Anti-Semites are intellectually dishonest, and Ilhan Omar suggesting she isn't anti-Semitic is exactly what an anti-Semite would say. She can't have any rational objection to Israel because we think she is anti-Semitic. We should discourage Ilhan from speaking on Israel at every turn because whenever she does, she spreads anti-Jewish hate speech that limits the choices of innocent Jewish people and how they are seen by society. How could you accuse us of being anti-free speech? Not all of us are advocates to use the government to censor you, just that we call critics of Israel anti-Semitic to limit the options of these critics and how they are seen in society. Obviously this isn't my position, I don't even have an informed opinion on Israel, but I understand the consequences of cancel culture and political correctness hurts not just bigots but people with legitimate concerns who can easily have the same label but not possess any of the required attributes to be a so-called bigot. I also understand that Israel is a sensitive issue where there is a lot of genuine anti-Semitism within this debate, but there are also people who don't hate Jewish people or even the Israeli people but oppose the policies of the Israeli government. This conflation of anti-Israel sentiment and anti-Semitism is quite popular. There have even been concerns that the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism may wrongly include criticism of Israel as automatically anti-Semitic, regardless of the context or reason. And in that sense, Ezra Klein was right to say that there is power in claiming to advocate for free speech. However, what Klein doesn't seem to take into account is that there is also power in claiming to be against bigotry. And by applying Philosophy Tube's rule to the Israel issue, we could see that speech that calls anti-Israel slash pro-Palestine groups hateful or anti-Semitic limits their choices and how they are seen in society, regardless of whether the accusation is justified. These anti-Semitic accusations would make it more difficult to support anti-Israel causes due to negative perceptions. In this way, cancel culture and unjust accusations function similarly to hate speech as outlined by Philosophy Tube, which is why it is surprising that in the same video Seda accuses those criticizing Ilhan as anti-Semitic as being Islamophobic themselves. It appears the majority report are not familiar with the concept of irony. 
Sure, that might have been an legitimate example, but why is a Muslim congresswoman being accused of anti-Semitism, Islamophobic? Some would argue that there is a lot of anti-Jewish sentiment in Islam and their culture, similar to how progressives argue that there is anti-Semitism and racism in Christianity and the American South. But Seder doesn't want to talk about these ideas similar to how some, but not all advocates of Israel, would scream anti-Semitism rather than debate the policies of Israel. Seder's hypocrisy knows no bounds, as I have highlighted in previous videos, but it doesn't stop him responding with this. Sometimes things are hard to spot because they're not there. Now, as one of those 75% who are apparently not sophisticated enough, as a 50-some-odd-year-old man, to be aware of, uh, of anti-Semitism. I, frankly, am offended by that. Well, well. Mr. Seder is appropriating a popular, bigoted, alt-right talking point where a self-hating minority that sides with the fascist Republicans claims there is no discrimination or systemic bigotry in society to delegitimize the concerns of other minorities and Uncle Tom. Sam Seder is the Candace Owens of the online left. I could, of course. But Seder and his dribble didn't care when these criticisms were levied at minority conservatives and may have even engaged in it themselves. I mean, look at she's going around promoting people Okay, who it's indisputable they are gateways to right way to right wing ethno nationalism. So maybe she should be looking in her own work for those people who are not seeing where anti Semitism comes. It may be the case that Dave Rubin and Sam Harris are not anti Semitic, but certainly they've given a platform to people who have spread these type of things. And they have given a platform to people who have given a platform to. My gosh, Seder, this is such a reach. You want to complain not only about the people who give a platform to, but the people who give a platform to people who give a platform to anti-Semites and fascists. Well, Mr. Majority Report, you would belong to that latter category, since debating people means you're platforming them, especially when you tried to debate Steven Crowder, who himself platformed anti-Semite Owen Benjamin, you even gone out of your way to try to debate Dave Rubin, who has interviewed some not-so-reputable people. By your own logic, you are a gateway to anti-Semitism. I do think Barry Weiss is being a bit unfair to Ilan here, but you, Seder, have done the same thing thousands of times and can't stand when one of your own is receiving the same treatment. But we are not finished yet, as this next gem inspired this entire video. I firmly believe criticism of Israel shouldn't equate to anti-Semitism. As a Jewish person, this tactic has long exhausted me, especially when used against Bernie. However, I've been startled with some of the ire misdirected at Jewish people and general anti-Semitism I've been anecdotally seeing as a result of Israel's aggression towards Palestinians. I also find it troubling many on the left are not just ambivalent to call it out, but angered when AOC or Bernie do. Calling out anti-Semitism isn't a distraction from our Palestinian brothers and sisters' struggle. Calling out anti-Semitism is calling out anti-Semitism. And it's important and we need to stand for one another. Uh, I agree with you. Um, I think part of the problem is that the equation of, of criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism by disingenuous people on the right, some in the Jewish community, some not, is what drives the anti-Semitism. Because once you say criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism, then it only logically follows that if you are mad at Israel, you're mad at Jews. Like, I mean, they're, 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 and I'm not, I'm not justifying this at all. And it, but it gives license to people who are anti-Semitic to do this. You know, make, make no mistake, this isn't making new anti-Semites. It is anti-Semites feeling emboldened in this time uh, because there is criticism of Israel and so much of that criticism has been um, rejected as anti-Semitic. <laughs> oh, that sounds very familiar. You know, the same argument everyone to the right of Cheng Yuga was making that if you called everything racist, sexist, Islamophobic, or fascist, that it devalues the meaning of these criticisms. 
This emboldens actual racists, sexists, Islamophobes, and fascists, since we're in a boy who cried wolf situation. This can be comparable to the Israel and anti-Semitism situation. I just want to further elaborate that I don't have a position on Israel, nor am I claiming that all advocates of Israel engage in conflating all critiques of Israel as anti-Semitic. But I also have a message for the left. If you aren't careful, cancel culture will come for you. The same punishments that you dole out for hate speech will come for pro-Palestine groups. If you're interested in more response videos to progressives, I am cooking one up for the Young Turks on the baby formula shortage, and in the meantime you can check out my playlist that responds to the likes of Kyle Kalinske, Sam Seder, and Richard Wolf. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give a like and comment as it really helps my video in the YouTube algorithm, and if you like economics and political commentary, consider subscribing. Maybe follow me on my Twitter, and see you later.